In today's video, we are going to destroy the myth that lead acid is cheaper than lithium. Lithium is way cheaper than lead acid batteries, and we're going to use battery studies and data sheets to substantiate my claim. We are going to talk about specifically what makes a lithium battery way cheaper than a lead acid. So the first price determinant factor is going to be the usable capacity. In a lithium iron phosphate battery, if it says 100 amp hours, you get 100 amp hours. With a lead acid battery, typically if you look at the data sheet, you will get a thousand charge cycles with a high quality AGM if you are cycling it down to 50% depth of discharge. And that's very important and a lot of people typically stick with 50% with these because you need to charge them up every single day so that they do not damage themselves. They like to be fully charged all the time. So that means that a 200 amp hour lead acid battery is the same as a 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate. But we have colimbic efficiency losses. At most, these will be 95% efficient, and these are 99% efficient. With a flooded battery, the super cheap ones, they're only 70 to 80% colimbic efficiency wise. So instead of like a 100 amp hour being the same as a 200 amp hour, it's more like 220 to 230 amp hour because the internal resistance is so high. So long story short, a 100 amp hour lithium is the same as like a 220 amp hour lead acid. And if you're using a cheap flooded one, like the six volt batteries from Costco or Trojan, you can bump that number to around 250 amp hours. Now the next factor is charge cycle life. This is where lithium destroys lead acid. First, let's take the cheapest AGM off of Amazon. It's the UB121000. If you look at the data sheet, you will get only 500 charge cycles at a depth of discharge of 50%. If you buy a high quality AGM lead acid, you're going to get a thousand charge cycles if you do a 50% depth of discharge. So already, the VMAX tanks, which cost more than, you know, the UB121s or whatever, or even the Trojans or the cheap ones at Costco, these are still already cheaper than all the other lead acid batteries around. And that's why I recommend these. Also, these have lower internal resistance. And columbic efficiency wise, you can have less solar panels on your roof. Now let's compare this to lithium. Okay, instead of 1,000 charge cycles, you get 3,000 to 5,000 charge cycles. And the crazy thing is, is at that limit, when this hits 5,000 charge cycles, typically it will last 5,000 charge cycles for solar because of our C rating or how fast we are charging and discharging this battery. You will only be at 80% capacity. You can still use this battery after 5,000 charge cycles. You can still use this battery after 8,000 charge cycles. And some of the lithium iron phosphate batteries are doing warranties to 10,000 charge cycles. These are like five to 10 times cheaper than these already if you are comparing a cheap lithium iron phosphate to a high quality AGM. Like the price comparison is just crazy. I would make so much money if I was selling these all the time, but I try to get people to get these ones because these cost so much already with just usable capacity and charge cycle life. It is crazy. It is so easy to hit 5,000 charge cycles with the lithium iron phosphate. I mean, considering the C rate that we're working with, even if we have a low C rate for lead acid, especially flooded lead acid, the columbic efficiency losses alone mean that we need to make the capacity so much larger just to even get those charge cycles for our specified application in depth of discharge. It is so hard to get power out of these things. It's very difficult. The next factor is weight. These are a lot lighter than a lead acid battery. This thing is a 100 amp hours and it weighs like 70 pounds. This is 100 amp hours, but it weighs 30 pounds. But remember, we need like two and a half of these to make one of these. Okay, so think about that for a second. We're talking like 140 pounds of battery to make the same as a 30 pound battery. There is a huge difference in weight. And this is the heaviest chemistry around besides lithium titanate. So if you were using NMC, then it would be way less. That's like my old Tesla battery compared to this. It was like half the weight for the energy density or the specific energy. And if you have a mobile system and then it's in an RV or a van, that means that if you have big heavy batteries, you're gonna spend more gas because your fuel efficiency will be suffering. So lead acid costs more in that regard as well for mobile systems. So now that we understand the usable capacity and the charge cycle life, let's do a quick cost comparison. Now that we understand that we 
we need 200 to 220 amp hours of these to make one of these and we actually have cheaper options on the market available for $600 right now off of eBay and stuff we are going to take the price of this which is 274 on their website right now and we're gonna double that and so that will give us $550 so for the price of this one without colimbic efficiency or pukert effect losses, we're really giving this a hard chance right now. It's already cheaper to buy a $600 lithium iron phosphate just with the usable capacity alone. If you add the charge cycle life into this, it makes these five to 10 times more expensive. I mean, there is a huge price difference. These cost so much more money. Even the most expensive ones that last longer than the cheaper ones cost way more than the lithium iron phosphate. And so if you see on Amazon those $100 AGMs and you calculate how much you get for how many years for the charge cycle life, you are spending even more than both of these. So the cheaper batteries in solar cost the most. The lithium batteries that cost more, like the Simplify, they have a 10,000 charge cycle life guarantee. That is insane. Even a, like a lithium titanate, you can pull 20,000 charge cycles. And that's not doing anything special at all. I would not use lithium titanate for solar, but I'm just trying to make people wrap their mind around the price difference. It is substantial. It is like so much cheaper, it's crazy. It's hard for me to even imagine why anybody would use these still. But if you are building a system that will only last one or two years, these can work. And also, I think the biggest disadvantage to me personally is when I design a battery with lithium iron phosphate especially a drop-in replacement I'm limited by the BMS discharge rate so that means that this can only discharge 100 amps continuous so if you want a 2000 watt inverter that's 12 volt with these that means you're gonna to need to buy two of them and put them in parallel so that you can pull 200 amps and then you can have a 2,400 watt inverter and induction load wise and having a safety headroom. That's like a 2,000 watt inverter to run safely. So with these, these can pull like 500 amps. So these have great output and they are absolutely incredible for starting cars. For starting cars, lead acid is great for the price and even the size. I have a small 35 amp hour lead acid and that thing can crank, like it can start my generator. So they are incredible for starting engines, absolutely. But you must understand that that is a shallow depth of discharge application. You're only pulling like two to five amp hours every time you start your vehicle. Where lead acids fail is when you have to deeply discharge them. With the lithium, they don't care. And you also don't need to charge them up every single day. You always want to cycle these and charge them up all the way to the top every single day. So that's why a lot of people need to make a large solar array to make sure that their lead acids stay healthy. With a lithium, it doesn't matter. You can keep this at 50% state of charge for months and it will like that. It will actually last longer. So very different um, thermodynamic properties. Next, let's talk about temperature. So these can both discharge at low temperatures, but um, lithium iron phosphate and most lithium ion chemistries cannot charge when they're freezing. And that's just a fact with the electrolyte. You can't do it and it will damage it permanently. But this is so easy to get around. If you already have a Victron, you spend 40 bucks for the temperature sensor and it is overpriced. But the amount that you save long term using a low temp cutoff system for lithium is still way, way, way cheaper than lead acid. Like you are just, it's crazy how different the price is. Also, you need to think about the capacity of lead acid when they're cold. I forgot the exact data sheet stats, but we did a calculation in one of my older videos. And if you had a cold battery and you're doing large loads with lead acid, we would only get like 16 amp hours usable out of the full 100 amp hours. With a lithium, it will heat itself up in those cold circumstances and you do have a bit of a reduced capacity, but it's not nearly as bad as the lead acid. So you will get like 90 to 95 amp hours instead of 100 amperes, but this one will only get like 16 to 20. So there's a huge difference. Even though these can technically still be charged when they're cold, they do not like to be super cold if you want higher performance. And some people complain that these are temperature sensitive, but all batteries are. If these are really hot, the performance will increase, but charge cycle life will degrade as well. You will have your temperature compensation. But I do see why people would use these for starting batteries in freezing temperatures. It makes good sense. You can be in freezing environments and these will still work. Not as well, but it will still do the job and lithium will just turn itself off. There are actually lithium iron phosphate batteries on the market by Relion 
Xeon and another manufacturer, I forgot what who they were, but they're putting heaters inside the batteries that are powered off of the battery cells themselves. So if you want one of these that works for lower temperature application, you can find one. The next factor is performance for 12 volt appliances. If you look at the discharge curve of lithium iron phosphate, it stays around 12.8 to 13.3 volts. Okay, the moment you put a load on this and you look at the discharge curve, it's more linear. Yes, it is, but it is decreased and there is more voltage sag and you will have decreased performance. You have less power available. The internal resistance is so low and the voltage curve is at a slightly higher, but still advantageous for 12 volt appliances that you will have good performance until this battery is dead. When this thing's at 50% depth of discharge, the performance will decrease. Next fact is a lot of people talk about safety and some lithium chemistries are combustible and they are dangerous, absolutely. But lithium iron phosphate and like lithium titanate, they're non-combustible. I can literally shoot this with a gun and it will steam a little bit, but there will be no fire. If you compare that to lead acid, if you overcharge this and this starts gassing and the valves can't handle it, the overpressure valves, because this is sealed recombinant system, this can explode. Look up pictures and videos of lead acid batteries exploding. I actually have a lot of respect for these because I saw one explode in my dad's shop when I was younger. It is crazy. You have freaking sulfuric acid flying all over the place. So I would argue that these are way safer than lead acid batteries. Also, the next factor is charge algorithm. You can use a constant voltage to charge this. I mean, you can set your absorption and flow and be done, and it will work perfectly fine. With these, all lead acids, you need multi-stage charging, you need temperature compensation, and you need to do equalize. With AGM, you can technically equalize it, but it's kind of hard to do it right, and it's very easy to overgas and like lose some of the electrolyte through the recombinant system. So I don't recommend doing that. You just want to stick to your AGM sealed settings on your controller but it's crazy because people are so used to charge controllers that have settings for lead acid and they don't understand that these are actually way easier to charge it's just constant current for a long time and then constant voltage for absorption and then you just float it so it's so much simpler to charge these people are just used to the lead acids the next thing I want to talk about is people will come up to you and say, oh, no, no, no. My lead acids worked for solar for eight years straight and they're still going strong. That is wrong. And if it's still going strong, it's because they're not using them. They are not using the capacity of those batteries. You cannot fight the laws of thermodynamics. You cannot change the numbers on those data sheets. Physics wise, you are constrained by these to whatever they can give. And if your battery actually did last eight years and the internal resistance isn't much higher from sulfation, you're not using the battery. So please just ignore it when people say that. Next fact is that these can charge a lot faster than these. If you think about how hard it is to push power into these just by internal resistance wise, you will need a lot more solar panels on your roof to accomplish the same thing. Another factor is with the solar power system, you have max power for around five hours a day. That's when the batteries need to recharge. And if you are trying to do an equalized function with like a Trojan battery, and you've been you know, setting the voltage to 14.5 and you're trying to equalize those properly and adding water as it states in the manual, you're gonna be in for a bad surprise when those Trojans die very quickly. I've killed Trojans, I've had two sets of them when I was younger and I killed them very quickly. It was like a year and a half and I had extreme decreased performance and capacity. They even had some studies and safety bulletins on the Trojans saying to charge them up to 14.7 because they are chronically undercharged. And that is very difficult to do when you're in a solar power system. Keeping your batteries at 14.7 constantly with 12 volt panels and only five hours of sunshine a day is very hard to do. But lasting a long time for a lead acid for solar with 50% depth of discharge, no matter how much money you spend, if you cycle them properly to 50% every single day, they're gonna last at max three years. You might be able to get five years out of them. And if you do like 20% depth of discharge, you might get seven years out of them, but you're not using them. At that point, you'd have to buy a huge bank 
to be able to do a 20% depth of discharge. With the lithium, you could replace like four or five of these with one lithium iron phosphate at that depth of discharge. So again, these are way cheaper if you factor that in. You need to factor in all of these things, depth of discharge and charge cycle life at that depth of discharge. You can't get around these. These are like the laws of thermodynamics and we are constrained to them. Another thing is form factor size. So if you look at an NMC battery and like a five kilowatt hour battery pack with the Tesla, it's like 55 pounds and it's like this big. You know how much lead acid you would need? You would need like 700 pounds or something. I forgot what I calculated it out to be. I mean, you would need a huge bank of batteries and a Tesla battery can fit on this counter. It's like this thick. It's crazy with lithium iron phosphate specific energy is double NMC. But look at this, compare this to this. You need two of these for one of these. Like even the size form factor wise is just so much smaller with any lithium battery. So I hope you guys understand that lithium is way cheaper, way better. And even if the charge cycle life wasn't as good, just the internal resistance wise and safety of these is why I would choose it over lead acid. Like once you go lithium, you never go back to lead acid. Tell me a single person that has swapped out their lithium batteries for lead acid. Tell me one person that was unsatisfied with lithium batteries for solar. I've never heard of a single person. So yeah, please let me know what you guys think in the comments section. I really want to hear your guys' feedback. I'm also going to list out a bunch of battery studies and things that you guys can read over. And there will be lots of really good information that you guys will love. It's really cool reading about this stuff. So yeah, I will talk to you guys later and I hope you guys enjoyed this video. See you later. Bye.